afternoon. Welcome to our live Room for, de for Debate uh, Roundtable. I'm David Firestone, a member of the New York Times Editorial Board, live here from the opinion floor of the New York Times building. Today's discussion is part of a series of Google Plus Hangouts from our opinion department. Uh, a few hours ago, we had a uh, historic ruling from the Supreme Court uh, on health care, and we've gathered a uh, group of experts uh, to discuss it. Um, from uh, left to right on the bottom of your screen, we've got uh, Grace Marie Turner, Everybody. who is president of the Galen Institute, a nonprofit uh, research organization that focuses on free market ideas for health care reform. She's the co-author of Why Obamacare is Wrong for America. Next to her is Michael F. Cannon, who is director of health policy studies at the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank. He's the co-author of Healthy Competition, What's Holding Back Health Care, and How to Free It. And next we've got Robert Reich, former uh, Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. He is the Chancellor's uh, Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley and the author most recently of Beyond Outrage, What Has Gone Wrong with Our Economy and Our Democracy and How to Fix It. And finally, we have uh, Maggie Mehar, who writes a blog for healthinsurance.org. She's the author of Money Driven Medicine, The Real Reason Healthcare Costs So Much. Bob, I'd like to start with you. Uh, we've seen how one man, the Chief Justice, and his decision to go with the majority uh, has affected the health care for million, many millions of people. Why do you think Chief Justice Roberts decided uh, to go with the majority to uphold the uh, entire uh, Affordable Care Act with a couple of uh, exceptions and, uh, and uh, to reinterpret uh, the nature of what uh, the individual mandate is? Uh, I think that Chief Justice was becoming increasingly concerned about the public's declining confidence in the nonpartisanship of the Supreme Court, uh, particularly after Citizens United. You know, the Chief Justice is in a very unique position in the court. Uh, the Chief Justice is the custodian and guardian of the institutional integrity of the court. And so those partisan decisions, at least those decisions that looked partisan because they divided the court right along, whether they were Republican appointees or Democratic appointees, uh, were of increasing concern to the Chief Justice. I am absolutely sure about that. And he, on an issue so central to the Obama administration as this Accountable Care Act, uh, just did not want another 5-4 decision. I think he did everything he could do to get Kennedy to join him uh, and uh, affirm the constitutionality of this uh, case. Uh, he had a perfectly good uh, Court of Appeals case from a highly respected conservative jurist, Lawrence Silberman, uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia that affirmed uh, the constitutionality of Obamacare. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the chief uh, just wrote the opinion because he wanted to preserve and protect the institutional integrity of the court. Certainly it's not logic. I mean, if you look at his opinion, it's not logic. We'll get to that in a moment. He Can used I kind of a, well, he, Grace Murray, he used kind of the second backup argument uh, to uphold this, the idea that the uh, individual, individual mandate is a uh, tax. Uh, do you think he was reaching uh, for an argument that would uh, allow him to, uh, to form a majority that was his part in this, do you think? Well, you know, first of all, it's really interesting that it's considered to be a nonpartisan decision when the White House likes this decision. So I think that it would have been easily have gone the other way, clearly seeing the passion among the dissenters. But, but I think it's important to look at how incredibly narrow this decision really was. The Chief Justice and, and the majority basically said, no, you cannot base the individual mandate on the Commerce Clause. That is a stretch too far. We are going to call it a tax. So that's a, that's a real slicing. And also they said with the Medicaid mandate that the states were being coerced if they were going to be forced to lose all of their other Medicaid money, as the law says, if they did not expand their roles up to 133% of poverty, which is more than $30,000 a year for a family of four. So I think that it's a very narrow decision. They didn't uphold the whole law. They upheld the whole law only in the sense that they, on very narrow grounds, validated these two provisions that were challenged before the court. I would, I would say they did not uphold the law. They did not uphold a law, any law that passed Congress. They have held a law that did not pass Congress and that would not have passed Congress. This ruling does nothing to validate or legitimize this law. What happened was Congress passed an individual mandate that says 
that under the commerce power, they're using their authority to regulate commerce to force you to buy health insurance. They did that because if they had said that this is a tax and we're going to tax you if you don't buy health insurance, it never would have passed. The Supreme That's Court true. came in and said, the Supreme Court came in and said, well, they might have called it uh, an exercise of the commerce power, but we're going to treat it as an exercise of the taxing power. So what the Congress said the mandate is, the court said is unconstitutional, but what the Congress said the mandate is not, the court said is constitutional. Basically, what the court just did is it upheld a law that Congress didn't pass and told Congress that it's okay to lie about what they're doing in order to get something past uh, the, the voters. And so this has nothing to legitimize this law at all. If anything, it's going to just deepen the backlash against this law where you've got a um, vast majority of independents who wanted to see this, this individual mandate struck down. And I think, and I'd like to hear from both Maggie and Bob about this, I think that even supporters of the law have to admit <laughs> that the Medicaid ruling is a serious setback because it allows states to block that portion of the law. I want to get to the Medicaid ruling, but first, on the issue of the tax, Maggie, do you think that Congress was lying, or was it taking a... Absolutely kind of not. The Congress, everyone knew, in Congress that was and my, my claim among the, Congress the public, Canada. everyone, if I could finish, everyone knew that this was a tax. They called it a penalty or a fine because they didn't want to use the word tax. But everyone, anyone writing about this, including me, said, of course it's a tax. We all know that. For political reasons, politicians didn't want to say that. Next week, today, the Republicans are going to be saying, we're going to repeal this law. Now, I could call that a lie, because they can't repeal the law. They don't have the votes in Congress to do that. And even if they had the votes in Congress, we know that President Obama would veto any attempt to repeal the law. So we all know that politicians say things that simply are not true, like, we're going to appeal the law or this law is unconstitutional. And here's a very important point. When the law was first drafted and people wrote about it, no one suggested it was unconstitutional. Then a few Tea Party people said, this is not constitutional. Media picked up on that. Constitutional scholars across the country were asked what they thought. They said, overwhelmingly, it is constitutional. Are you kidding? But the media picked up the story. It was a great story. Supreme Court may overturn most important piece of legislation that Congress has passed in 47 years. That's a great headline. Press loved it. They feasted on it. At the time that the oral arguments began, I wrote, there is no way the Supreme Court will strike down the mandate. And I predicted that Justice Roberts in particular would uphold the mandate because he is concerned about the integrity of the court, and how it will look in history. And most constitutional scholars were very clear. There was no constitutional basis for challenging the law. So now and we know that it's... The Supreme no Court better just than disagreed than with you. The Supreme Court just disagreed with you by a 5 four majority. They said there was a constitutional basis for challenging the, the, this... Michael, what you're Congress saying is that four power. men disagreed with me, okay? Five men. No, five men. Okay. They said that... No, the four men... Disagreed no, with me, and here's what's argument. really no, important. Maggie, you're Hundreds wrong. of constitutional Maggie, scholars across the country the said it was on, constitutional. On, the New York Maggie, Times recently no, 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 ran a story polling constitutional scholars. Five Supreme Please Court don't talk over me. Michael, Michael, hold on one second. Claim. Hold on one second, Michael. I'm sorry, Maggie, finish your thought. We'll, uh... Yeah, what I'm saying is that the Times recently ran a story polling constitutional scholars at major law schools throughout the country, the vast majority said the law is constitutional. But they also said that we think this court is going to vote its politics, not the Constitution, and so we think they'll strike down the mandate. That was a very interesting story and told you what you needed to know, that in fact, the law was constitutional, according to people who know the Constitution best. But right. Maggie, they, they, they all said... to do was unconstitutional. The court upheld, uh, or struck down five to four, the claim that the co commerce power gives Congress the ability to do this. That this is what has, Congress claimed. This there never that really had challenged. anything to do with the Commerce Clause, okay? Everyone knew that. Law. Absolutely, yes, I have, many times. Well, then and you know in the findings everyone of, knew in the findings that, that was section, simply the individual mandate, they a guise. The All right, let's, let's broaden this, so just, let's this out lies. just a little bit. Now I, we know that this is a tax. Can I have a penalty, Bob? 
What effect does, does calling it a tax have? Uh, well, look, at, I, I, the irony here is that many people uh, in the White House, many Democrats, many on the left, uh, wanted originally uh, this law to be framed uh, as uh, and to be administered as part of Medicare, part of uh, uh, the whole payroll tax system. Uh, Medicare is so popular. Uh, Social Security is so popular, uh, the idea was, and this has been the democratic ideal for at least since Franklin D. Roosevelt's time, the ideal was to have a health care law that was premised and locked into the payroll tax. Uh, but of course, as an effort to appeal to Republicans and as an effort to uh, extend a fig leaf to get the 60 votes needed in the Senate, uh, Obama ultimately had to uh, frame this very, very differently and create uh, an act that was not based on the payroll tax, but was based on private insurers uh, and based on an individual mandate. Which I might add, uh, you know, in, in fairness to uh, uh, to uh, conservatives and to Republicans, uh, the individual mandate is very unpopular. It's unpopular among liberals. It's unpopular among Democrats. Uh, a lot of liberals and Democrats don't like the idea of having of being required to buy insurance from the private sector profit-making company that might uh, that might raise prices uh, if there's not adequate competition. Uh, so this is very very politically unpopular. It's going to be a huge political football uh, over the next four months. Uh, Romney is already, in fact, ads are already uh, uh, condemning uh, this act. Uh, they've been running for the last month. I expect them to be even even more intensifying over the next four months. Uh, and so that the popularity of this act is different from the issue of its constitutionality. Uh, I don't think, I, I you know, I, I think that Maggie is absolutely right. Most constitutional law scholars say uh, there's no issue of the Commerce Clause. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Roberts bent over backwards, kind of did a pretzel-like. I mean, you look at his logic, it doesn't make any sense at all. He, he's saying that uh, this act does not is not constitutional under the Commerce Clause, but it is constitutional as a, as a tax. Well, by that logic, you know, Congress could pass a law that violated free speech under the First Amendment, but it could be uh, legal uh, if the penalty for violating free speech was interpreted to be a tax. I, I mean, I, that's just a, that's a bizarre logic uh, from but the end. It's <laughs> really important, I think, to point out that the government, when it was talking about this before the court, continued to say that this was, they, they, they validated the individual mandate under the Commerce Clause. The court has said, no, that is not a valid basis for the individual mandate. And Maggie, you were saying that the, the, um, the taxing power, that this is, you couldn't tell people that it was a tax. Of course, we all knew in Washington, you said, that it was a tax. But we couldn't tell the American people. That's exactly why the American people are so upset with Washington. Race race. First of the all, the American was, people understood from the beginning they that did this not. was a tax. Well, then the why American couldn't the president say stupid. that, Maggie? If you tell them that the federal government well, then is the going to take stupid, money, they understand that this is a tax. But let me suggest that. that we move beyond the Commerce Clause. I'd hate to spend the whole half hour the talking president, about the President. The Commerce Clause was the central... Was quite right. The Commerce Clause was a big leap. And I'd like to bring up what's really well, at the heart of this, and that is the mandate is itself. And what no one has really mentioned yet is the mandate has, very, has no teeth and affects very few people. Well, the mandate Maggie, affects Maggie, only the small group of people you're, you're who buy their own insurance in the individual market. Maggie, you're That's a small group admit, of people. And secondly, what, it doesn't force anyone to do involved. anything unless you think a $95 fine constitutes a full force. This mandate has been blown up way out of proportion. Michael, Very few Americans would be affected by it. That's, that's incorrect. Michael, to her point Contrary, that this is a, this Contrary, is a very to small penalty. Myth. Contrary to popular myth the IRS will be able to use fines and imprisonment to enforce individual mandates. That's absolutely not that true. That's absolutely I'm correct. I'm sure you know that that's not I'll true, explain Michael. It to you. Don't tell um, me you're lying, Maggie. I'll explain it to you in one minute, and then you'll understand why it's true. If the IRS, the law says the IRS cannot use these things. But what the IRS can do, if you owe a $1,000 mandate penalty, it can take your first $1,000 of income tax withholding, deem that to be payment of your income tax or your, in, your individual mandate penalty and then say you are a thousand dollars in arrears on your income taxes and come at you with every weapon in their arsenal including fines and imprisonment 
It is functionally okay. the same as, in, as putting you, you in prison for not paying the individual mandate two tax. Two years ago, and you must the IRS decided that I owed a large amount of Maggie, money Maggie, on capital gains you, you that I never to, made. Maggie, they to never attempted to Maggie, take my house. David, can you they never tried Maggie to put me in jail. Time? And they finally figured out that they were Maggie, wrong. Maggie, right. you have to let me... You're exaggerating now, what you the IRS the does. Argument, way, way, Maggie, way out of proportion. Maggie, you're Maggie hold on one second. If you're going to make the argument that the individual mandate is okay because, you know, it's just a, functionally it's a tax and everyone knows that, then how can you say that the IRS cannot put you in prison for failing to buy health insurance when the functional equivalent of... Uh, uh, when they do have the power to do the functional equivalent of that? But Michael, even though the IRS does have that power, we're talking about a very small fine here, tax, penalty, whatever you want to call it. It is, it it is, it is not a substantial... It is not, it is not small. It can be 2.5% of your income, and that, can be, and, and that can be thousands of dollars for people. No, actually, Michael, it's, it's, it's in 2016, it's 2.5% of your income up to $2,000. There's a cap on it. Can, can, can I interrupt here? Uh, because there is a very important uh, issue here about the, the way the act is going to uh, operate. I mean, what this decision does, uh, essentially, is it gives the nation an opportunity to actually see how this thing operates. Uh, uh, the uh, Romney Care in Massachusetts uh, had a lot of detractors uh, when it originally went into effect. Uh, and the population of Massachusetts, citizens of Massachusetts, gradually came not only to accept it, but also uh, a, a majority, if you can believe the polls in Massachusetts, actually like uh, Romney Care, if you want to call it Romney Care. Uh, and, uh, but the big issue that Romney Care left open was exactly the big issue uh, that Obamacare leaves open. That is, how are you going to control the costs? Uh, and I think that Massachusetts now, uh, given the experience Massachusetts has had, is now turning to the next phase of the health care debate, which is real, genuine cost control, which it has to do. Uh, this is what the Supreme Court uh, decision essentially did for us. It gave us time uh, to work out the kinks, uh, to work out all of the problems, uh, to uh, see how this can be adapted uh, so that it works for most people, and also uh, to face the real ultimate question here uh, underlying everything else, which is how we get control over rising health care costs. You know, that was the first thing that the American people wanted Congress to do. They said, we need to cover 50 million people, and we need to get control of costs. Those were the two major issues. And this law is already increasing costs. And, and Mr. Secretary, I, I really beg to differ. I don't think we're going to find out how this law goes into effect because it simply can't work. States are going to continue to to drag their feet in implementing exchanges. We can't afford the subsidies. We're going to wind up with Doug Holtz Aiken estimates as many as 35 million more people in the subsidy pools. We simply don't have the money to pay for that. You're taking money out of Medicare to create these new subsidies for working Americans. The states are going to balk at expanding Medicaid. I think we actually have a bigger mess now because there's so much uncertainty. You've got 20 new taxes in this law in addition now to call in the individual mandate a tax. It's already stopping um, companies in the medical device industry from hiring people. There's a huge tax increase on health insurance companies, $87 billion. It's going to be passed along to people in the form of higher well, taxes. I Can think we talk for a second yeah, about the uninsured? Governor Romney spoke about this decision this morning and talked about replacing it, uh, but he didn't say anything about covering the 35 to 50 million people who are uninsured and who benefit greatly from this decision this morning. Michael, is there any plan uh, that Republicans have ever put forward that would provide coverage to those who lack it and who are going to continue to lack it? Well, if they aim for universal health insurance coverage in their proposals, then that's a mistake. The uninsured, there will be fewer of them, and they will be better off the less the government does to try to help them. Because when government tries to make health insurance more affordable, as with Obama and his care, it has the opposite effect. It makes it less affordable. Listen, so, uh, let's, and so, let's, let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk practical 
realities here. I mean, the practical uh, so reality if I can finish, is that the, the, insurance, the subsidies, most uh, people ask me a in emergency rooms, if they can't get health care, it costs a fortune. Uh, the country right now is spending 18% of GDP on health care. We've got to find some way of getting control and expanding coverage so people get preventive care. Everybody agrees on this. I mean, the real interesting question uh, to me is the operation of the exchanges, the insurance exchanges. And that op that, that's going to give states very wide, wide leeway to do some very interesting interesting experimentation with regard to controlling costs. Uh, in uh, Vermont, for example, is already taking the insurance exchange and essentially creating a public option. I mean, it, it's sort of a back door to uh, a kind of uh, a Medicare for all. Uh, you're going to have exchanges elsewhere that are going to do some, some very different things uh, to try to control costs. Uh, this, to me, not the subsidies. Uh, this, to me, the exchange is one of the most interesting parts of this law in terms of working it out and over the next couple of years. Let me just say about in terms of health care spending. Hold on, Bob, and um, to me. States are refusing to create second. these exchanges precisely because they don't give people the states the sort of flexibility that Bob suggests. And if they refuse to create an exchange, they can block Obamacare's individual mandate. I'm sorry, their, the employer mandate in their states. And I want to ask Bob and Maggie. Because the statute allows the states to refuse to, uh, who, who refuse to create an exchange to block the employer mandate, and because this ruling allows states to refuse to expand their Medicaid program, isn't this law really hanging by a thread? I mean, Absolutely the rule, not. Is, it, is it that Medicaid Last ruling? Last weekend, I talked that, to is the Medicaid um, ruling a defeat? Timothy Jobs, Washington and Lee. Could I please continue? Yes, please, or no? go ahead, Maggie. Thank you very much. Um, last weekend, I talked to. Um, Washington Lee Law Professor Timothy Jost, who's widely considered an expert in health care reform law. Federal law trumps state law. The states will have to launch the exchanges or the federal government will do it for them and the federal government has the funding. But more importantly, more importantly, a number of people have stated that the reform legislation does nothing to slow health care spending. The fact is that since the legislation was passed, Medicare spending has slowed greatly. Former CBO director Peter Orzag has written about this, and I've talked to him about it. Orzag is on the board of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and what he points out is that hospitals have already begun to lower the bills that they're sending to Medicare because they're starting to become more efficient. They're cutting down on preventable readmissions. Some hospitals have become very um, successful in reducing preventable hospital-acquired infections. Medicare spending has slowed. Some people say this has to do with the recession, but the fact is people on Medicare, by and large, should not lose their jobs because they were retired. They Great have breed. a steady source of income, and that's Social Security. So health reform legislation has a great many ways in which it is going to slow and reduce health care spending, if you actually read the law. Grace Marie, now to that, that point, that. Yeah. now that the law is, is considered constitutional and people are going to start to see the components of it that they like in perhaps greater detail, is there a chance it could become more popular, uh, as it, uh, especially as the president starts to uh, talk about it a little bit more vocally on the, uh, on the trail? Well, it will be interesting. The president basically has not talked about it much for the last two years, and I right. think that he's not going to have any choice but to talk about it now. One of the things that a number of studies have shown, actually, is the more people find out about this law, the less they like it. They don't like the 159 new boards and commissions and agencies and programs in Washington that are going to be in control of their decisions over health care. They don't like like the Independent Payment Advisory Board, the Medicare board that is going to ultimately have a great deal of power, uh, independent, unelected officials who can make decisions about Medicare spending and what's going to be paid for or not. They don't like the fact that the federal government is going to tell tell employers that they have to provide coverage. Employers, there was one study, I believe, by McKinsey and Company that showed that about a third of employers were seriously considering thinking of getting out of the business of providing health insurance but offering the, to pay the fi paying the fines instead. The more they knew about the law, 30% of them didn't like the law. The more they knew about it, the law, 50% of them said that they were going to drop coverage. If I may, if I may, uh, as a veteran of uh, Bill Clinton's efforts, uh, to uh, have universal health care. 
Uh, one thing that, that is well known, and, and we've known it ever since Franklin D. Roosevelt originally decided not to include health care in Social Security, uh, we've known it since Harry Truman tried health care, universal health care, is that people are very scared of losing what they have. They're more scared of losing what they have with regard to health care than they are eager and hopeful of getting something more. Uh, so it's very easy. Uh, for to demagogue these issues, to to come up with all kinds of uh, you know you know uh, uh, death panels and everything else, uh, and we're going to see that during this next four uh, months. But what the Supreme Court decision has done, and I want to emphasize this, is create the opportunity for the public to actually experience what this law is all about. It does give states some flexibility. Uh, I do think there are some cost-cutting measures, not nearly enough, uh, in the law. I think it will. I think the experience will be remarkably similar to what's happened in Massachusetts, uh, in terms of uh, the people in Massachusetts, uh, with a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation, gradually coming to grips and liking the the health care they have, uh, but n understanding that they've got to get on with the next phase, which is more seriously dealing with health care cost control. Uh, so this buys time. Can we just be clear about it? What this does is it buys time uh, for the American people to have experience with something that we in the United States, unlike every other rich country in the world, just have never had. We don't know what it is, uh, and again, there are a lot of fears about it. Robert, I think that if people no get to know it, I think they're going to like um, a, what you like to call Obamacare, and I would add also that um, the polls have shown an improvement on how people view the law, and most importantly, the most recent polls show that the majority of people like the law very much if it weren't for the individual mandate. Now they're going to find out exactly what the mandate was all about and that it would not have affected 90% of them at all. And if it did, the fines would have been very small. Once people realize that about the mandate, they're not going to be as uncomfortable with it. And already, a great many small employers have taken up the, the um, option of getting tax credits if they offer insurance to their employees. These are people who in the past didn't have insurance or didn't have very good insurance. Now, under the law, employers can get 50% of what they pay for the insurance back from the government in the form of tax credits. Can I deal? I would like to ask a yes or no question, please. Um, Bob and Maggie, given that 26 states sued to block the Medicaid expansion because they thought it was too costly, does the fact that the Supreme Court now made that a costless proposition for them, that they can, uh, that they can refuse to expand their Medicaid program without losing any federal funding, isn't that a setback for the law? Yes or no answer, please. No. Uh, I'm, not, say something more? I'm, not, I'm not going to agree, Michael, to your terms of debate in terms of a yes or no uh, answer. I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think it's, a, I, it's certainly uh, a setback in some re uh, respects, but I, I'm, I'm a believer you know, within a framework like we have with the Accountable Care Act. As long as you have certain common denominators, as long as you have certain uh, basic standards, uh, if a state wants to do certain experimentation, that's great. I mean, we'll learn even more. Uh, and Medicaid is one of those areas where uh, some states that want to uh, try something different, if they want to try something different, fine. I think the political pressure will build if, as I suspect, the states that really do go along with this law, including the Medicaid part of the law, uh, have the kind of successes that I expect that they will have, uh, there will be political pressure in other states to adopt uh, the same provision. So yes. we'll find out. Guys, we have to, uh, we have to wrap up. Uh, but I really want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. Thank you, David. And uh, if you thank want you. to, uh, anyone who came in halfway can see the... Um, uh, full uh, hang up by uh, going to the Room for Debate page. You can play it uh, as many times as you'd like. And we urge you to stay with the New York Times uh, website through the day. We are going to see news updates, blog updates. We'll have plenty of uh, opinion updates as well uh, today and uh, for the next week or so as, uh, as this filters out through the campaign. Anyway, thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, David. Both the, uh, thank you, everybody. Both the experts who are here and the viewers who joined us. And we hope to do this again soon.